Uh, last, we have Paul Caserta, who is an archives management concentrator. Uh, he's volunteered at various museums in Boston and Providence, and will be presenting Provenance, the new chapter in the museum narrative. presentation um, I originally did uh, with a colleague of mine when I volunteered at the Museum of Fine Arts over the past year, uh, whose name is Victoria Reed, and she is the curator of provenance at the museum currently uh, for the past think, eight years now. And what you see ahead of you on the screen is uh, plaques that are currently placed in different locations in the museum. And I didn't really know about these until just a year ago when I first started researching there. And I went on the tour that Victoria Reed gave talking about provenance of collections. And at the time she brought us to all of these paintings that were Dutch paintings owned by Jewish families at the time and that were taken during World War II and how many museums um, started an initiative of how to create uh, restitution for many objects that were stolen and how to get them back to their families. Um, so many things that you see coming out of that now are such movies as The Monuments Men, which not completely accurate, but it creates awareness. So with that, um, So with that, um, I start, I went on this presentation and afterwards I thought about, you know, we have collections, we have all sorts of stories with our collections. So with that, um, why don't we look at provenance of our collections in a different way? So this talk is going to discuss the importance of recording and sharing the provenance of our collections positive effects and difficulties of proceeding with this type of research, and how provenance can be used today with the technological world that we live in. I always got to keep a backup handy, just in case. So, with that, the uh, title of my presentation is Provenance, the New Chapter in the Museum Narrative. And as you can see, I used the lovely ability of Wordle. I don't know if anyone's used it, but it's fantastic. Um, this little tool just pretty much takes any words that you put in, so you can take a paragraph of text out of a case study, perhaps, and you can uh, put it in this program, pick some colors, and it'll bring out the most uh, used words in different various shapes and sizes. But I really used it besides it looking pretty. Um, because the idea that provenance has to deal with so many important topics in museums and archives and special collections. 
it talks about where's the information coming from as part of our past. It talks about the research that we have to do to actually get to it, the database that it's in, linking the information to get to it, our end users, and sharing this cultural and societal information. So where do we begin? To me, objects and documents are a source of personal, individual identity. This is an idea institutions such as archives and museums understand well, for past personal identity in the materials we hold are now social and cultural identity, and history from time passing over the years. As an example, a painting or a diary or even an Egyptian sarcophagus are all physical objects that we can see, but they each hold a story, a narrative of when and where and how and by whom they were created. Actually, long, I just lower this for one second. The other photograph I have here, an example. Now, the item that you saw, I'm going to talk as a fair over here. Um, the item that you saw previously was a label that was put on the wall of the museum. And this label corresponded to this picture right here. And as you can see, figures of a standing youth from China. Now, what you would not notice here, unless you actually had this label of this stone statue, is that you, a youth person, in garb, and then holding these sticks with these two birds in the hands. <coughs> Looks decently authentic. Now, if you look at this picture of the same exact object, anyone notice anything? That photograph, if we go back, was taken when it was at the archaeological site. So again, in the archives, from when they first discovered the object, and now we know that those birds were added on at a later time period. And when you look at the definitions that we currently have of provenance, it's fitting to think about looking at these objects. We have the definitions of provenance and provenance access, which comes from our own glossary of, uh, I believe it's records, management, and archival terminology. I forget the complete title. Um, but we still don't know so many things about the origins and the custody of ownership of some of our records. Questions have been arising over the past decade or so, too, about how objects get from point A to point B. Who's owned it, as I've said? Has the object changed over time? Who actually owns the copyright to some of the materials and more? And this information is important for archives and museums as a fundamental principle in order to identify, authenticate, and give our researchers and patrons more history behind what they physically see or touch. In a way, I see provenance as a living oral history hearing of the past in a way not always perceived. So taking into account this idea in turn, it's not surprising that many archivists in past years have been historians, whose knowledge of time periods and the people associated with them is more concentrated and an understanding of story is somewhat more familiar. <coughs> Today, with the growing requirements for more standards, preservation, and participation in a digital world, many archivists are trained in library information science programs and do not always have the opportunity to perform historical and cultural research. And this isn't to say that newly minted archivists, such as myself, aren't dedicated to our work and that we don't have an interest, but more so that our digital world has changed the priorities of archivists to the point where in-depth study of collections may need to just be put on the sidelines. And this was very interesting uh, when I presented this recently at uh, NEA Sprint Conference. Um, Professor Jeanette Bastian of the Gisless Department beforehand uh, had made a comment during her own uh, time of presentation where she had mentioned to a group of us how she feels like something in our field of archives currently has changed and that we are beginning to forget certain things that we used to do. She didn't really know what that was, but she said that, or why, but 
that she felt like there were certain things from when she started out that we were missing. Um, some like components to what it was originally like. So in this digital time that we live in, in the environment where many users inside and outside of our institutions want more information online at a click of a button, the archival and museum communities have been urged to upload our collections for others to see in use in shorter time spans than the past years. So how do we continue to improve upon our services while also advancing ahead? My answer is to use the resources we already have and change our policies and procedures to include more provenance information. And this isn't always as difficult as it sounds. First, when we access, when we accession collections into our archives from our patrons, why not do things such as take in also, if possible, oral histories? Information can be gathered in detail about who has owned the materials in the past, stories connected to items, why were objects created, and more. And more than anything, they might actually be very appreciative that we're doing this and donate more in the future. And this, when you think about it, it adds a new layer of understanding to the materials that we are taking in and ingesting into our archives. And since giving it not only a new perspective to the materials, but also a personal experience to the users that are going to use it later on. And some of my examples that we have, you know, we're always asked to digitize our collections, to create metadata for them, and upload them to our online websites and our portals. Well, if our institutions are going to do this anyway, why not add provenance to our collections as well and get that online along with the rest of the material? Um, I know from my time at the museum in our database, and they use TMS, the museum system, they had provenance information in the database, but not all of it is available online. Then, by using mid metadata standards and ter tagging terminology we already have, a whole new field of information is available for researchers to find online. And we also ask ourselves in our daily activities as archivists, how can we expand our reach to our users and let them know we have this material? Again, my answer is to use the tools and resources already available to us. At times in our institutions, we have exhibitions of our collections, which can be displayed both physically or in person, or on digitally online. Imagine interactive stations in a historical society playing an oral history or a video with narratives about the documents that are in front of you, or recordings of sailor shanties being traditionally reproduced by new musicians, curators speaking about an object's history and how it was acquired, and many more examples. And all these examples I've just told you are actually being done. For instance, right now, Massachusetts Historical Society likes to use social media and they post many of their digitized items, and one of my examples I saw the other day on Facebook was uh, Abigail Adams' letter, uh, Remember the Ladies, and they have this letter digitized and up on Facebook, but also they put to it a new dimension of thinking. Instead of just the descriptions of the item, they also add um, theories from philosophers and scholars in the field about why she wrote certain things at the time. So again, just a different example. So for other tools, such as social media, such as exhibits, an interesting way that we can always do this is the grants, again, that have always been available to us. And they're not just grants for archives, like NHPRC. There are grants for oral history organizations, for museums, historical societies, secondary education, there are multiple different organizations out there that offer grants for different types of projects. And one of the examples I just mentioned to you from Massachusetts Historical Society. Let's see if this one works. 
This was an online exhibition from a couple of years ago from the Smithsonian Institute of American History. And it was about all different time periods of uh, fishermen and different time periods on the water of trade and merchants. So when you go down, you see many digitized items, such as maps. You have some advertisements here from the 1850s for umbrella, umbrellas and other items made out of whalebone and baleen they used for busks. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, I love this one. So painted it. Poor guy. Um, other items made out of wood and cast iron. And you can keep going through this as part of this online exhibition. But as you go down to the bottom, they have another idea. And lots of amazing scrimshaw, if anyone's ever been to the <coughs> Petra Museum. They have songs, traditional sailor songs that were actually, you know, introduced. Once again, turn down the Example. A hundred years on the eastern shore. Oh yes, oh a hundred years on the eastern shore. A hundred years ago, when I sailed across the sea. Oh yes, oh my girl said she'd be true to me. A hundred years ago, as you can see there. Are So again, multiple interesting examples of how we can introduce almost a three-dimensional feel to our collections. Because when you think about it, even museums, why do we go to museums? We go to see an exhibition, and we walk in a room, and we open up sometimes those specially sealed section doors, and you see the giant text panel on the wall, and possibly paintings or other objects that we're looking at, and it gives us that experience, that little daily lesson of history and learning of different areas, peoples, and times that we just don't know of. So again, it's how do we give ourselves that experience. And another example I have of possibilities of what could be, very far reaching here, but when we have things such as Art Store, the image library for the arts and sciences, it's very pretty. Uh, you can go through and you have to sign up um, just as a college or an instructor or a researcher, you have to go through a process of actually signing up for the website. But there's no information really about the items versus basic history. What if people who donated these images actually gave just a little bit of history too, instead of just having it as an image portal for us to find things for the classroom? I mean, one person can make an argument that we already have Google. You know, and although not everything is on Google, Google is not God, unlike some people think. Um, it is an idea for the future. And of course, the benefits of adding more provenance information would be to advance scholarly research. I like to think about institutions such as the MFA or the Mets, possibly if they had more information for individuals out there, all the individuals, it would also benefit smaller institutions that don't have a possibility to actually put their collections up online if they need help authenticating objects or need help doing more research about the objects they have. And it gives great educational opportunities. And of course, the difficulties. There's always a resource difficulty of staff, finances, and other things. Um, there's the difficulty of people not wanting to change traditions, especially in museums. You have many curators, uh, the MFA, who actually didn't even want to put the signs up that I showed you in their galleries. They thought it was an intrusion among the arts and their collections. And sometimes <coughs> people don't like to give up records and don't want to give up information. And when giving up information, also donor relations. Uh, there are a lot of donors out there who donate their collections, but will say, oh, please, please don't include that information. And we're not saying, you know, confidential information like social security numbers exactly. Um, but sometimes there are difficulties along the path. And 
with that, um, what I can say is that I hope that over time more historical research is done in car archives towards provenance, towards the collections. I just think, in a very general sense, that it increases what we're trying to do in the first place, which is to give not only these objects to our users, but what the objects are about, the narratives about these objects, and I think it will only um, increase the possibilities of what we can learn. And think that even if you're not going to get charging lockers, so you hit on something that I think that libraries often forget that that is a role that we play is assessing what our users, how our users are interacting with the spaces around them, and how we can better facilitate that in the library itself. Um, so if we need to put in little charging pads and that sort of thing, again we're, we're assessing that people need to charge stuff, and however we're going to facilitate that for them, let's facilitate it so. So that the library is constantly a relevant place for users. Mm -hmm. um, I was in South Korea last summer and <clears throat> toured the library. They built a Samsung. Do you want that way? Oh, that's so amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And one of the things that they did was they built these booths for people to do language listening and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they were all empty and they were all unused. And he said, because of course everybody now does it on their smartphone. So they're thinking, gosh, what are we going to do with these rooms now? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can brainstorm a little bit. Let's say we bought the lockers, and then next year nobody wanted a locker. Everybody wanted to um, use a pad or something mm -hmm. like that. How would you think about repurposing the lockers? I mean, what, what else could we do with that? Yeah, I think that is a serious concern. I mean, even when you just look at the pictures I had immediately, uh, it was very conservative renovation so that that issue can be avoided as much as possible because no one wants to waste money. Right. Um, as far as the lockers themselves, I mean, I don't know. You, I, I would brainstorm how to, that there's going to be a company out there who's going to take that metal and find a use for it um, and be able to repurpose the, so just if it has the digital keypad in it, um, use that for something else. Um, Part of the smaller study that we did with the Beatley space, we looked at what, we actually were, we were gonna get rid of the shelving altogether, it's just gone, and what to do with it. And so with a little research into that, there's a whole industry of companies that buy shelving, used <coughs> shelving, crazy, these people make a lot of money buying used shelving. Um, but you have institutions like schools or I mean, think about where you find shelving. It's everywhere. Any bookstore you go to or I mean that's a, a, a small example but um, <coughs> they want to get rid of their shelves and get new ones. So there are these companies that buy them. You can buy from them. Um, they come, they take them apart and take them away for you. So I have found more than anything through this research and stuff that's led up to it um, that if there's a question like the one you have, there is someone out there who has started a company to make money off of, of doing that. Do you think that to a certain extent, I mean, the, so what you're talking about is a little bit of obsolescence, right? So we, we set up a system and by the time we're done setting it up, everybody else has moved on. Um, does that feel sort of paralyzing in terms of innovation in libraries? And, and For me it has over the course of being at Gislis. Uh, I feel very frustrated because I feel like my um, when I was talking about the topic of space and renovating library space, um, articles on that and, and that trend of discussion in the academic world, uh, like I said, that was 10 or 12 years ago. 
people, it's still coming up and in our classes, I feel we're still being taught that that is a new issue that that we should explore and, and do more research on. I think it's over, I mean, we get it, we got it. Anyone who could afford the $50,000 renovation did it. Now, no, no one's gonna give us, a few schools will, will spend that much money on small space renovation. Um, and that's why I've been trying to think of ways to take the space that, that you have, whatever it may be, if you had your renovation or not, and use some of that money for things you really <coughs> need especially technology, um, that is going to serve unmet needs. So besides just the aesthetically pleasing. Um, on that note, Northeastern, where I, I went to Northeastern for my undergrad, they redid their library. Um, and it's all like neon green and blue and very tech-oriented, uh, common spaces, open. It looks beautiful. Well, <coughs> I started reading blogs. All the furniture, I guess, is so poorly ergo ergonomic that like the students can't sit on it and do work because it just kills them typing and everything. Um, and the students are all complaining that it's so uncomfortable and they don't even want to be in there, you know. Um, so what are they going to do with all that furniture now? That's a good question. Um, but that is just an ongoing issue. So if we purchased a bunch of those riding around desks. Who knows what will happen in five or six years, but I just, um, I think encouraging academic libraries to be more innovative and be an entrepreneur within their institutions is what needs to happen so that they're finding a niche. And I think the lockers, for me, I was like, this is a niche because they're not in the student center, but if the library does it, then the student, or Say the library is like the manager of lockers on campus. So they have some in the student center, but it's library and next to it they have a reference desk that's manned four hours a couple times a week or book delivery, all the other things we talk about, you know. Um, if I may, I think that addresses or like brings up a really uh, interesting thing that's been brought up over and over since Michelle's talk this morning too is what libraries want to be and to whom. Um, you know, when we're talking about bringing in 3D printers or charging lockers or moving the books off site and making ourselves sort of digital labs. Um, I know when I was an undergrad at the University of Florida, the big thing was that they brought in a bunch of big plotter printers from the GIS folks so that people could print out big, big like posters in the library. Um, and there's all kinds of cool artistic things you can do with those because they're not very high resolution, or whatever. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's going to require a lot of self-reflection, I think, to figure out uh, as a community and at each individual like institution to figure out what we want to be because we don't have the resources to do everything. And yeah, well, <laughs> and, and even just more pragmatically, mm -hmm. I mean, if each of these are three thousand um, dollars and the library has a limited budget, do we want to sink nearly $20,000 getting six of these, or should we be spending that on periodical subscriptions, or some sort of digital project, or, um, and I don't know, there's not a simple answer to that. Well, and I think your point also speaks to both your presentation and, and what Paul was talking about, potential enhancements. And not only do we have to figure out what, what we want our physical library to be, we also have to figure out what we want our digital library to be. Um, and a lot of that has to do with finding out what our users want our, our digital library to be and what, what would be useful to them. I mean, the shanty songs may be really great, but, but if nobody really goes and listens to them or it's just like a you know, party joke or something like that, is that really what we, where we want to put our effort towards? And how do we know until we actually ask? And we're really bad at asking. Um, we, and we, we keep saying, you know, we should ask. And then we never do. Um, so. Wow, we just tied it all together there. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> I say that uh, what you do is you buy the $20,000 printer and use that to make all the pieces. For lockers. For the lockers. <laughs> that is a really good idea. <laughs> well, I think also just the being flexible 
I think is a, a theme that comes across <coughs> as being able to change, you know, with the times. But so I had kind of pictured, or what I hope comes out of the research I've done, and is um, it being a program, right? So you start small and you you add. So yeah, lockers are cool now, but you keep it. You just get like eight or five and see what happens. But you have a little money and you see do some surveys or whatever, and then furniture is the next thing. Well, then you get a little chair or desk with the pads on top and see where that goes. And you know, with technology, is so expensive. And I think that is part of what keeps the library from taking those big jumps of being taking risks, is that you know your phone that you bought this year, it costs, what, a quarter of the, the amount? It's like you drive the car off the parking lot and then it loses its value by 50% or whatever it is. <coughs> so it, it is a money issue, too. But the more important we are, the more money we'll get. Yeah, you know, I, Kathy, I think you bring up a really good point, and this is something that Tim and I were discussing last night um, about this interaction between practitioners and users and understanding um, the user base. And, um, you know, because knowing our users also helps us as practitioners, right? It helps us um, prioritize, and specifically in regards to digital archives, um, these are things that Tim was bringing up. Um, it helps with indexing and display. Um, and something that Tim also brought up that I thought was a really good point, we were talking about metadata, um, is that a, a, we shouldn't be afraid to do it as more of a grassroots effort. It doesn't, it doesn't, we don't have to go to the Library of Congress and ask them for permission. I think if, if a small group um, of, of, whether they're practitioners or, or students, you know, um, can, can do this work and we can show that it's successful, I think other people will hop on board. It doesn't need to be a mandated thing. Um, and I, I mean, I see that as a potential direction that we could be going, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then I fully agree with all of that, and then, and this comes to the Of course you agree, with your identity crisis. Yes, <laughs> um, but I think this is sort of the identity crisis where I get excited by all these digital projects, and at the same time, the New York Public Library shipping off their books from the, you know, public research room to New Jersey sort of infuriates me. Because really, at the end of the day, anyone can set up a computer and give people internet access. Really, any physical space can be a community center. But what is it that is intrinsically unique to libraries, archives, and cultural heritage institutions? It, it's that we bring together these, the physical space for these resources where people can come without having an expectation of them having to pay to do so. Um, so it is a bit of a community space, and it's a bit of a digital lab, and whatever, but there's there's a, a reason for the space's existence that goes beyond just being the community space that can be all things to all people, and I think we'd be wise not to forget that. I don't know what that means in practice, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think it, the library is a, maybe the identity is, is more of uh, information hub, you know. So whatever way people are absorbing, using, distributing information, it's going to keep changing, and the library is, should be a place for that experiment and for doing that. So there's something beyond just people getting together in a, in a common place that, right. that happens in, in the library information space. Right, and that people getting together to do these sorts of things happens in all like kinds of places that we don't call libraries. So what is it that makes this uniquely library centric? Do you have a question? Uh, actually, um, I was wondering, uh, Public Center brought up the use of social media. Has there ever been the idea to ask these questions over social media instead of like to other museums as well? I was wondering, would that help? Or social media not really reliable for for the archives or for um, you mean in terms of like a survey? <coughs> yeah, survey that can only Well, surely like the blogosphere has a large presence, and unlike unlike social media like Twitter, where <laughs> you're in a very contained space, right. um, you can you can explain your methods. You can 
um, provide links to surveys. And I, Matt, I don't follow it too closely, but I follow it relatively, um, that, the, that the Library Archives Museum blogosphere they ought, I mean, like the, 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 these are dialogues that are yeah. being, that are happening, that are occurring. Um, so sure, I, I think that there is. Yeah. Although I would, I would argue that there are dialogues that are happening between librarians, archivists, and, and museum folks, and we're not actually talking to the folks on the green line um, to yeah. find out what they think about what makes a library a library and what makes it special and, and that right. sort of thing. Yeah. And that's that's who we're, that's who we need to tap into. Well, and yeah, the funny the things are very rarely ever involved in. I'm sorry. I said the, the users are very rarely ever involved in the conversation. Right, and I think that is the biggest point of our project because I realize none of this is new. It's just relatively new in a digital environment. Right. But repositories have been doing user demographic studies since there were repositories. I mean, it's very rare that you can go into an archives without them giving you some sort of patron information form that you fill out. But we don't have the same expectation for digital projects. Um, and actually, one article that I read, uh, the Leaders Project in the UK, which was the National Archives, the Welcome Library, a couple others, did this sort of user demographic study, but they did it of their physical repositories to determine what their digital projects should be. And this was in the 90s when they were still trying to figure out what they should do in a digital area. But I thought it was interesting that they thought that this user demographic information was important, but then once they actually had their digital projects up, didn't think it was important enough to do in the environment that they were actually thinking about and developing, they just assumed that it would be, well, either they assumed that it would be the same <coughs> types of people or you know, priorities just went elsewhere. We all have limited staff, limited money, limited time. But, but that's like the question about why the lockers aren't more um, popular with students. Well, I can tell you some of those answers because I go on the blogs and I see them talking about it, you know? And it's, you know, the management of how it's distributed. <laughs> it's, it's total chaos, like trying to get one, year long waiting list, stuff like that. So there's, the, this, the users are, are talking about this on sort of a social media conversation. And I think as researchers or when we're doing research, that that is um, valid data, I mean, that is, a, I can't, it, it becomes harder to quantify and stuff than giving a survey link, but I feel like I know a lot about what the user's opinions are from them expressing them in these sort of informal discussions. I want to understand something about the lockers. Yeah. Um, so are these things that you, like in amusement parks where, um, any person can go and grab a locker and put stuff in and walk away with the key and come back? Or is it something that you sign up for well in advance and you have it for this semester long? Yeah. Um, because if that was the case, then I can see why it would be as popular because it's limited I access. saw, I've seen both. So I think a lot of it is just like a first come first serve ad hoc basis. So you find an open one, you, you can take it. Um, but I know some of the schools, especially the heavy research universities, the big ones, Wisconsin, something like that, they have a lot more privileges for their grad students and that there will be waiting lists for grad students who want one of these lockers. Um, so that's a way that in an institution or maybe a, a certain location, a company might do it. But now at airports or amusement parks, at uh, airport, people want, want the kiosks. Right, yes, they want something that's open air so that they can just stand there. I mean, I hate layovers, but if I had a longer one, I might want a locker. <laughs> Probably not, though. Yeah, but there's security concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you again to our panelists for all of your wonderful presentations. Can we give them another round of applause? <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for coming today. It wouldn't be a success without the people here to ask the questions for these wonderful panelists. So thank all of you. <laughs> so round of applause for all of you. Thank you for tech support. Yay, tech. <laughs> I also 
want to thank all of our volunteers and our entire committee. And I know you know who all of you are, so please wave who's left. Thank you. I know we're all very tired, and so thank you again for coming to our symposium. And I want to throw it over to Kathy. Um, yeah, I'm, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> who we also like to thank. Um, so this is the third year that we've done this symposium, and, and actually the third year that I've kind of been faculty liaison for, mostly because it grew out of SCOSA, and, and so um, I would love to get feedback on any ideas that we have for next year, and this is the first year that it's been a standalone gifts listing rather than out of a student group. It's actually its own student group now. Um, and so it's constantly evolving, constantly developing. So if you have ideas for the future of, of the symposium, as well as Library of Archives and Museum, um, we, I would love to get that information from you. So please email me. I'm pretty easy to find. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and the other thing I would say is that this is a student initiative. So I didn't. I wasn't sitting in my office one day and saying, I think we should have a symposium. I actually had the leadership from SCOSA come to me and say, we want to do a symposium. Um, and it can't happen without the enthusiasm of the students. And so I, I, I say thank you to the committee for their tireless, and, and appearing to be tireless, effort to make publishing off. Because it really, we've been working all year. Um, and admittedly, we didn't work very hard in the fall, but we've been working doubly hard in the month of March um, to actually make this happen. And to have such great panelists to participate is really, um, I'm sorry that everybody who presented isn't here, because I was, I was astounded by the quality of all of the presentations. I thought they were really just wonderful. Um, so you all made me proud, committee members and presenters. Um, and please, you know, let me know if you have ideas for next year. Right? Thank you for thank you. Thank, thank Annie for her <laughs>